Today's video is kindly sponsored by Guardio. Find out more later on. Hey, 42 here. We humans have a natural desire to belong, which is probably why we're constantly forming groups and societies to belong to. Getting together with people who share common interests can be a rich and rewarding experience. There are quite literally millions of clubs and associations to choose from, and they are as diverse and in many cases bizarre as humanity itself. Many associations have prerequisites for membership. Take for instance the Ejection Thai Club, which is for pilots who've survived being ejected from an aeroplane. That's a pretty niche group by anyone's standards, but membership numbers are surprisingly high at around 6,000 people worldwide. Pilots who've tried and failed to eject from their stricken planes could potentially be eligible to join another unusual club instead, the Uttar Pradesh Association of Dead People. The group was founded by Lal Bihari after his application for a bank loan was denied on the ground that he was, in fact, deceased. That came as a bit of a shock to poor old Bihari, who considered himself to be in pretty good health. But it turned out his uncle had bribed a state official to have Bihari declared dead in order to steal his inheritance. As a result, Bihari was considered legally, if not biologically, deceased for almost 20 years. That might sound like another fairly niche group, but the association currently boasts a staggering 20,000 members, all of whom are legally dead. Luckily, you don't need to be deceased or the survivor of a freak accident to find a group of like-minded people. For example, simply being a white supremacist with an interest in fundamentalist Christianity and burning crosses should be enough to get you through the doors of the Ku Klux Klan. A notorious hate group whose membership numbers peaked at around 4 million in the mid-1920s. That was about 3.5% of the US population at the time. Of course, if you aren't pale-skinned and a fervent Protestant, your chances of acceptance into the KKK are dismal. But those odds weren't enough to deter Ron Stallworth, the first and last black man to become a card-carrying member of the Ku Klux Klan. Now, the internet is a wonderful thing, but as the world becomes more connected, the risk of being scammed or hacked increases with time. It's never been more important to protect yourself whilst browsing the web, and Guardio offers that protection in an effective first line of defense model, detecting threats in real time before they reach your browser and cause harm, as opposed to traditional methods that remove them from your device once they've gained access. Researching all these videos often takes me to very strange corners of the internet, and I come across a lot of dodgy websites. Many of them are there to do me harm, whether it's through phishing attempts that try to steal my social media or banking details, or fake tech support scams. So that's why I started using Guardio, so I no longer have to think before I click. It was super easy to set up. I added the Guardio browser extension, then I ran the free security scan to detect existing threats. And that's it. Join over 1 million Guardio users who've taken control of their online safety and never have to worry about visiting harmful sites again. To enjoy worry-free browsing and run a free security scan in just a few clicks to see what threats are on your browser, use my link in the description, and you'll receive an extra discount for the full browsing protection, which includes a seven-day free trial. Visit guard.io slash 42 today. Hurry up before the offer ends. Ron was used to being in the minority. Born in 1953, he joined the Colorado Springs Police Department as a cadet in 1972, and became the first black American to graduate from the training program two years later. From the beginning, Ron wanted to work undercover, and soon enough he was presented with the chance to do just that, when he was asked to attend a speech given by Kwame Tor, a prominent civil rights activist at a local nightclub. 
A few times during Tory's speech, Ron caught himself shouting and chanting in agreement, so it's fair to say it probably wasn't the most challenging undercover assignment in history, but that would soon change. The successful completion of the Kwame tour job saw Ron being posted to his department's intelligence unit, where he continued to blaze a trail, becoming the first black undercover narcotics detective in Colorado Springs Police Department history. It was in late 1978 that Ron came across a KKK recruitment drive in the classified section of a local newspaper. Who knows what the ad said, perhaps something like, A group of white bigoted crescents seek new members for carrying burning torches and shooting cans. Love of silly hats is a must. Any interested individuals were to contact Ken O'Dell, the organiser of the Colorado Springs chapter of the Klan. Expecting to be sent a brochure or a pamphlet of some kind, Ron was caught off guard when he received a telephone call two weeks later. The man on the line was Ken O'Dell himself, and he wanted to inquire further as to Ron's motivations for joining the clan. It was around this time that a few glaring problems with Ron's plan to investigate the KKK first came to light. Firstly, there was no plan, and secondly, he used his real name in the letter. Luckily, Ron was both quick-witted and very good on the phone. He launched into an angry rant about pretty much every ethnic minority he could think of, then rounded things off with an improvised story about an impertinent black man who dared to date his sister. Needless to say, all of this was music to Ken O'Dell's big racist ears. It was clear that Ron was just the type of guy the clan was looking for. But before Ron could celebrate his small victory, Ken dropped a bombshell. He wanted to meet his new recruit in person. Of course, a face-to-face -face meeting presented Ron with a minor problem. Namely, that far from being a white supremacist, he wasn't even white. Keen to avoid an impromptu lynching, Ron quickly set about finding himself a body double. The plan was simple. He would continue to play white Ron over the phone and in any written correspondence, but whenever he was required on clan business in person, a suitably white colleague of his called Chuck was drafted in. There was, unfortunately, one small issue with this approach. Ron and Chuck had completely different sounding voices. Surprisingly, on only one occasion during the entire seven and a half month investigation, did anyone actually notice this obvious vocal discrepancy. During one of Ron's phone calls with Ken, the Ku Klux Klan boss asked Ron why his voice sounded so strange, and Ron calmly explained that he was suffering from a sinus infection. Despite the fact the two men had seen each other just hours before, Ken accepted the explanation without the slightest hint of suspicion, even going so far as to kindly offer some treatment advice. What a stand-up guy! So, thanks to a combination of sheer stupidity, good acting, and perhaps the poor quality of phone lines in the late 70s, the clan remained convinced there was only one Ron, a man who suffered with allergies despite his perfect iron genes. With Chuck's help, Ron had successfully infiltrated the clan, and he began to extract as much information as possible whilst monitoring any potentially subversive activities. Motivated by a lifetime of racism, Ron threw himself into his assignment. He worked hard to endear himself to his clan colleagues, who he described as not the brightest bulbs in the socket. The bulb that shone the dimmest, though, was local leader Ken. In Ron's own words, the man was a total idiot. Soon after their initial meeting, Ken invited Ron over to his house to take part in an important clan meeting. Chuck, of course, attended in Ron's place, wearing a wire so Ron could hear what was going on. It turned out the meeting was to discuss the logistics of burning four 17-foot crosses at strategic locations nearby. All of those assembled agreed that it would be a deeply moving religious experience. But thanks to Ron and his undercover operation, the cross burnings were thwarted. As well as hoodwinking the Palm Springs chapter of the KKK, Ron also managed to pull the wool over the eyes of the clan's global leader at the time, David Duke, 
who carried the awesome title of Grand Wizard, despite his clear lack of a Hogwarts education. Ron was accidentally introduced to Duke when he phoned the clan's head offices in the hope of expediting his official acceptance into the organization. Clan membership would mean that Ron was eligible to participate in all clan activities, so he was eager to speed up the process. Ron's enthusiasm clearly struck a chord with Duke, who promised to personally see to it that Ron had his membership card and certificate posted out to him ASAP. To this day, Ron carries his membership card, which was signed by the Grand Wizard himself, in his wallet. It seems that Ron genuinely charmed the clan leader, and their excellent rapport would lead to one of the most unlikely relationships of all time, with the two chatting on the phone once or twice a week. Ron would massage the Grand Wizard's ego, and Duke would reveal all kinds of information during their calls. Every now and then, Ron couldn't help but bait the Duke, even asking him how he could be sure that a smart-ass black man wouldn't fool him over the phone by posing as a white man. Duke confidently explained that black people talked differently, so there was no chance something like that could ever happen. Wizard my ass. Duke later visited Colorado Springs for a PR blitz, which happened to coincide with Ron's induction into the clan. And in a strange twist of fate, the real Ron Stallworth was assigned to protect Duke after he received death threats. When Stallworth met Duke, he explains that he didn't agree with his philosophy or political ideology, but that his beliefs wouldn't interfere with Ron's ability to ensure Duke's safety. Ron made no effort to disguise his voice, but Duke never made the connection between his protection officer and the man he spoke with so frequently over the phone. At one point in the day, Stallworth asked for a photo with Duke, saying no one would ever believe that he had been the Grand Wizard's bodyguard. Brilliantly, it was Ron's white body double, Chuck, who took that Polaroid photo. And, just as it was being taken, Stallworth put his arms around Duke and another clansman. Being the massive racist that he was, the Duke wasn't best pleased with this turn of events, and he tried to stop Ron leaving with the photo, at which point Ron played the police card and threatened to arrest Duke for assaulting an officer. During their next phone conversation, Ron asked if anything interesting had happened on his visit to Colorado Springs, to which Duke replied with a racial slur infested story about a cop who threatened to put him behind bars. Thanks to Ron and Chuck's combined efforts, the undercover mission revealed a lot of useful intelligence about the clan's activities in Colorado Springs and beyond. During the course of the investigation, a number of clan members were revealed to be part of the military, including two senior members of the North American Aerospace Defense Command with top-level security clearance. Both men were reassigned. The undercover agents were also successful in preventing the detonation of a nail bomb in a Colorado Springs gay bar, a plan which had been cooked up by the KKK and the local neo-Nazi group. In the end, Ron and Chuck were perhaps too good at their jobs. Recognising Ron's dedication and loyalty, Ken O'Dell eventually put him forward as the future chapter leader for Colorado Springs at which point it was decided it was probably best if the investigation were closed and all evidence of its existence destroyed. After all, it would certainly take a bit of explaining if word ever got out that a couple of policemen were paid up members of the KKK. Ron complied with his orders, but he kept his membership card and the Polaroid of him and Duke as souvenirs. Remarkably, the world would probably never have heard this incredible tale had Ron not revealed the investigation in a 2006 interview. The story would go on to inspire the 2018 film Black K Klansman and serve as a source of much red-faced embarrassment for the Ku Klux Klan. If you've ever wondered why grown men wear pillowcases over their heads, perhaps that's why. Thanks for watching.